what a privilege it is to preach in this great church. You, you may not be aware of it, but the, the testimony of this church has gone a lot further than Sweetwater, Texas. And, and for a long, long time, how many of y'all know Raymond Dunn? Okay, that's great. Raymond and I were, were friends. We drank coffee every day when I pastored in Coleman. I know he pastored here for a number of years, and a great guy. He's with the Lord, of course, now, but uh, uh, just uh, f- all the way from be- before him all the way up to Brother Chris, who's doing a splendid job and has a great reputation. This church is well-known throughout uh, the Baptist Bible Fellowship and throughout the country. Let me say also, in the area of, of era of political correctness, I don't want to be on the news tomorrow for not being politically correct, so we have honored, and we will honor those involved in law enforcement and firefighting and so forth. And to be politically correct, I I want to honor our crooks today. Do we have any crooks here this morning? Let me just, okay, that's, do we have anybody has an arrest warrant out for them? Uh, At invitation, you certainly can leave very quickly if you'd like to, but I want to make sure. And thank you, Mayor, and uh, your dear wife for being here. It's always great in these to see uh, our elected officials and uh, mayors and so forth, just uh, uh, for if no other reason, know that they back up their their uh, firefighters and police officers and so forth. And, and in talking with he and his wife, I know they do, and I thank God for that. I introduced my wife. This is my wife, Peggy. We've been married uh, 50 years this last October. I told her if she's going to leave me, I'd go with her. So we hopefully going to be married longer. This is our grandson, Isaac. He's 14. He's single. Uh, we can't work out a deal here today if you'd, you'd like. He's raising us. We have 19 grandchildren, six great-grandchildren today. I don't know about tomorrow how many we'll have, but uh, I tell people at Christmas time we take out a 30-year note. Uh, but let me say again, once, once again, it is a privilege to be here. Uh, just uh, uh, let me say very quickly before I forget, because I reached the age where I can watch reruns. You know, that's, isn't that great? But I have a little table back there, and, and we don't have everything there because we haven't been able to unpack yet. We moved from Round Rock to Anson, Texas. Our house isn't ready yet, so everything's pretty well in the garage. We wanted, we were there the other day, and there was three cars at a red light. Oh, that scared me. That was a traffic jam. <laughs> uh, if you've been in Austin here late, you'll know. I mean, but we have a, a couple, and I just dropped one, which is usually what I do, uh, kind of wristbands. They're free. They say, so help me God. The red, of course, is for firefighters, the blue for law enforcement, but they're also available to what we'd call civilians, too. They're free, they're not any charge, love offerings and so forth. I get, I put mostly back into the, the ministry. Uh, there's some books there that are written by, uh, I believe it was State Trooper uh, up north. I, um, uh, I co- correspond with three or four, so I, I'm not real sure, but those also are for law enforcement officers and so forth, or any interest, and they're free also. Uh, but it is my privilege, I, as uh, Brother Chris said, I have been in law enforcement a number of years. And uh, let me say that we did have electricity when I started. Uh, we had indoor plumbing. 1969, I get back from Vietnam, 1968. Uh, there's two things I was able to do. That was pray and duck. And so I became a law enforcement officer. I was a trooper, a state trooper in the state of Ohio. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> I had married a Texan. And you know what happens when you marry a Texan? You move to Texas. And so that's we moved to Texas. I was a policeman in Austin, Texas, in San Angelo. Uh, so I've been a state trooper, a policeman in a large town. I've also been a criminal investigator uh, for sheriff. Uh, actually did all the, the felonies in this county and the city for eight years. Uh, chaplain as a commission officer for a number of years and pastored for 42 years. The uniqueness of that is I did many of those at the same time, but I tell people I've retired from law enforcement, retired from ministry, I'm only 35 years old. <laughs> Nobody believes that, and you shouldn't either. Uh, but it has been my privilege to be in both, and we'll talk more about that in a few minutes, but it is an honor that I have to be with you today as you honor the men and women that serve in the capacities in which we honor today. Not only in, in law enforcement, but firefighters, EMTs, those who have sworn and committed to protecting our lives and property, and often paying the ultimate price. Secondly, but more importantly, 
is the fact that we're here together on Lord's Day to honor our God. And certainly we want to do that. You know, without God, we wouldn't even be here. If it wasn't for God, we wouldn't have these people to honor today. If it weren't for God, our country would be in total anarchy. It would be survival of the fittest. There would be no safety, no freedom, no help, and no hope. The attack on our country in 9-11 gave valid evidence to the courage and commitment of men and women that serve in the capacity in which we honor today. On that day, in less than one minute, 343 firefighters, 60 police officers, and eight paramedics gave their lives, running into the towers to save the lives of others. And may I say to ladies and gentlemen that if they were here and alive today, they would do it all over again. That's, right. That's the commitment Amen. that these men and women have in our behalf. <clears throat> over 160 law enforcement officers die in the line of duty each year in America. And that statistic continues to grow as we biblically enter into these last days in which the Bible says evil men shall wax Worse and worse. I speak probably more along the lines of law enforcement today because that's my experience level. I've not been a firefighter or a paramedic, but I, can I say that uh, these men and women work hand in hand to accomplish the same purpose. And in, in speaking more in law enforcement does not mean that I think not so highly of the others because I think very highly of firefighters and paramedics, great guys and ladies that are always there to help. And uh, I appreciate them so very, very much. 58,000 police officers in America were assaulted in the line of duty last year in America. Why would a man or a woman want to choose the career or the profession of those that we honor today? Let me say, first of all, it's not a job. It's a life. Amen. It's a 24-hour day, seven-day-a-week responsibility. There's a lot of criticism in our society, more so than I began in 1969 in my career, concerning the law enforcement community. We've been tagged as a number of different things, and one of the things that has been tagged, which was absolutely false, is that of being prejudiced. Now, let me say this, that we as law enforcement officers do have some prejudice. I'm prejudiced against a man that would walk in a school and kill 17 children. I'm prejudiced against a man that would beat his wife unmercifully. I am prejudiced for a man who would rape an innocent woman. I am prejudiced of a man or woman who would sexually abuse a young child. I am prejudiced of a man or woman that would get drunk and get behind the wheel of a car and kill a family. I am prejudiced of drug dealers who choose six and seven year olds in America to mule or transport their drugs and get them addicted at a young age so they won't snitch them off. I'm prejudiced against MS-13 will come into our country and kill our people. You know, the unique thing is when an officer is called to a scene or a crime or whatever it is, we're never told what culture is involved or what race. Just the fact that there's been something committed, the officer is sworn to investigate that irregardless of the culture or the color. The unique thing, let me say this too is before I get any further, is remember this. Television is fiction. Yeah. Amen? Like MSNBC. No, I better not do, go there. But. <laughs> what you see concerning law enforcement on television, for the most part, is absolutely fiction. Not all, but very much. And so if you use television to determine what police officers are, you're going to make a really big mistake. 
Uh, I really enjoy it when they hide behind a couch when somebody has a machine gun shooting at them and the couch protects them. Let me give you some help. Don't do that. You'll spill blood all over the place. I mean, and then when a police officer kills three or four guys at 180 yards with a pistol, and they walk up and, yep, guess he did. Don't believe that stuff. And incidentally, our church, I also I help churches start security programs. We, we uh, train chaplains and so forth. But I established a security program at our church in Cedar Park, and I told our security team, about 20-some of them, and I said, there's two rules that nobody can disobey. Number one is nobody shoots the preacher. Amen. That's usually what I get at fellowship meeting. Nobody shoots the preacher. Do you say amen? amen. That wasn't very enthusiastic, Chris. Uh, <laughs> preachers are a dime a dozen, you know. And then, and then secondly, in our church, I tell them, if you shoot... Shoot low. You say, why is that? Because I'm standing higher. And I've seen some of our people shoot. So let me help you out here. Number one, don't shoot the preacher. More important than that, don't shoot the preacher's wife. Amen. That's free. As a law enforcement officer and the others too, you live in a glass house. People know what you do. They think they know what you do. Your children... Sometimes are ridiculed at school because you're a police officer. If you are in these professions, you don't do it because of the money. I'm certainly glad that officers get paid, but they're not in it for being rich or getting rich. And we say to being a law enforcement officer as well as the others, it's a hazardous position. In my career as a law enforcement, I've been shot at. I've been stabbed at. There's several times that I fought for my life in my career. Most police officers, fortunately, don't shoot their weapons during their career. I shot 12 rounds in my career. You can go from helping a child get home one minute and the next minute go to double homicide. You can help an elderly person across the street and a few minutes later get a call that you have to go to a scene where a child is laying in the driveway dead after being run over by someone's car. Someone says that you go from minutes of boredom to seconds of panic. You can save a life one moment and be called upon to take a life the next moment. All too often, in America today, an officer kisses his wife and his family goodbye. And another officer has to go back to the home later and tell that same family that their father or their mother won't be home anymore. Let me say also there's another group that needs honor and prayer, and that's the spouses of law enforcement officers, firefighters, and paramedics. They are our heroes. I can assure you, we don't become law enforcement officers for the glory. I respected law enforcement officers and really want to be one from a very early age. I jokingly tell people the reason I want to be a cop is because I love free donuts. But let me say this, policemen don't have time to eat donuts. I don't know where that ever came from, but preachers eat donuts. One night I had a dream as a law enforcement officer after I'd been saved and I had a dream that I worked one day a week and get all the fried chicken I could eat. I told my wife, I said, honey, pack, we've been called to preach. <laughs> it's not for the glory. I read something the other day. It, it says you cannot unsee what you see. You can't cry when you want to cry. I got a call, it's been five or six years ago, to go to a to home. I got, as chaplain, after I kind of retired, I, I got called out in every death and pretty much in Williamson County. And 
I didn't really know the circumstances, but as I walked or rolled up on the scene, I, a policeman was sitting there on the curb. He's six foot four, six foot five, big guy. He was sitting on the curb and he was crying. It's an unusual thing to see, quite honestly, even though the emotions of a police officer are the same as emotions as anybody else. And I walked up and said, hi. He said, I couldn't save him. I couldn't save him. I couldn't save him. And I talked with him later, but nevertheless, I went to the, to the house and, and walked in. And a grandmother was babysitting their two-year-old grandchild. And she had fallen asleep. And the child went out the door. And the door to the pool, or gate to the pool was unlocked. And the child fell in and, and drowned. The officer came by and did all that he could, and paramedics did the same thing, but the child was dead. The officer today, incidentally, is no longer a police officer because of that one scene. You can't cry when you want to cry. You can't show anger when you really want to be angry. You can't run when it's safer to run. A number of years ago, a friend of mine, first name is Leland, had kissed his wife and son and daughter who were four and two goodbye to start a day shift. Day shift, this was in Austin, is relatively safe in relationship to other uh, districts and times of day and so forth. And when he was on patrol, he worked downtown Austin. He got a patrol of two suspicious men in downtown Austin. If you ever been to Austin, everybody's suspicious in Austin. <laughs> they wear a shirt down there that says, keep Austin weird. I'm thinking, you don't need the shirt, dude. <laughs> Three blocks from our capital at 8th and Congress were two guys, and uh, they happened to be passing out some literature that uh, was Muslim, and, and they weren't Middle East Muslim. But nevertheless, he contacted them and talked to them about what they're doing. As it was policy, what do you call like that? We would run the names through the computer to see if they were wanted, and one of them had a warrant for a traffic ticket. Back then, a traffic ticket cost about $30. Today, You've got to get a 30-year note to pay your traffic ticket. But nevertheless, $25, $30. He said, Sir, I'm sorry you didn't pay your ticket. There's a warrant out for your arrest. I've got to take you in. Get somebody to bring the money and they'll release you. Rather than doing that, the two guys jumped the police officer, Leland. They stole his gun and shot him five times. 100 citizens of America stood and watched him die. And after they had shot him that many times, they had stole a bread truck, which was right next door, and ran over his body to where it was smeared along the Congress Avenue, three blocks from the capital state of Texas, while by this time, almost 200 citizens watched without giving any help. Later that day, other police officers had to go to his house and tell his wife and children, your dad will never be home again. In my opinion, it's been that for many years, there's two of the greatest professions on this earth. And again, I just say it's my opinion, first, to be a professional law enforcement officer. Amen. Secondly, is to be a preacher of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I thank my God on a daily basis that I've had the privilege in this life to do both. And I can tell you that it is an honor. And I have retired, but I started a new ministry called the Bible and the Badge because I believe they go together. Would you look, please, at Romans chapter 13? You say, is this sermon going to end? It will. Brother Chris said, I get, you, you can have all the time you want and just blame it on me, so I will. Romans chapter number 13. 
I want to talk a minute about biblically what is the Bible says about these responsibilities and professions, not jobs or professions that we speak about today. Let me say, number one, their authority and responsibility is ordained of God. Their authority and responsibility is ordained by God. Look at verse 1. Let every soul, I'm not sure, but that means like everybody, be subject unto the higher power. There's two Greek words that are translated power in the word of God. One is dunamis. We get our word dynamite from that. You'll read that in Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8. The other is ekousia. It could be translated authority. In our vernacular today, you read that in the Great Commission, Matthew chapter 28. All power, all authority is given unto me. The Bible says, let every soul, subject, or let every soul be subject unto higher ekousia, the higher authorities, for there is no authority or power but of God, and the authority that is of powers that be are ordained of God. God ordained the responsibility. It was up to us as a society to put into place those people that agree with God. Amen? I mean, in, in the area of, of what we're announcing today, whether you're a chief or a sheriff or a, a deputy or a police officer or a constable, firefighter, whatever, it's incumbent upon you and I uh, to agree with God and what God wants us to do. As a matter of fact, if you'll study the Constitution and the beginnings of the Constitution, laws that began in the United States, they were based on a guy named Blackstone over in England who was a believer that established their criminal justice system there, and it was all based upon the Word of God. And when they followed that, there was very little crime in communities. If we study the history of America, we'll find when America adhered to the biblical principles of the criminal justice system, there was very little crime in America. In fact, the first penitentiary in America was started by William Penn in Pennsylvania under the Quaker movement. The reason it was called a pencil, uh, penitentiary is because if you violated the law in that day, they put you in what we call a penitentiary, and you would stay there. They would take care of you physically. They would put a Bible in, in the place where you kept, and you stayed there until you generally repented. Does that make sense? Until you repented and gave valid evidence of that repentance and the re renewed mindset, and then you were let loose with accountability. That, ladies and gentlemen, was the foundation of what we call the penal system today. The penal system today, quite frankly, does not work in America. 81% of those that are in, in jail or in prison today <clears throat> will commit a felony within three years of getting out. That's eight out of ten failures somewhere. And I can tell you why. It's just my opinion. Is we've taken God out of the penal system. We've taken God out of the criminal justice system. We've taken him out of our schools. And the Bible said, be not deceived. That which a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Man is under the authority of God. All of us are under some kind of authority. My suggestion, ladies and gentlemen, is to be under the authority of God. It works a whole lot better. Verse number two of our text says, Whosoever resisteth the authority or power resisteth the, the ordinance of the law of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves traffic tickets. That might be a mistranslation. Anybody ever here gotten a ticket? Anybody here that didn't raise their hand for embarrassment? I've gotten a couple of them. I'll be honest with you. I'm gonna, how many of y'all, when they got that traffic ticket said, praise God. I'm not going to ask how many use the term God in a different form, but nevertheless. Say, why, does, why do police officers give traffic tickets? I can tell you why, because they've seen too many dead bodies in cars. I could shut my eyes right now and see 20 or 30 dead bodies in cars. You know, in America, today is 1.3 violent 1.3 million violent crimes in America each and every year, and it's going up. You look at the state of Colorado. Remember, the state of Colorado, if I'm not mistaken, was the first state that uh, made marijuana legal. The first week that marijuana le was legal in the state of Colorado, five state police cars were hit 
by drivers on the influence of marijuana. Their crime rate has gone up, and in the last month, two officers have been killed just north of Denver, murdered, executed. You see, when we turn away from the Word of God, we reap what we sow. 95,730 rapes in America, 7.9 million property crimes in America, Ten, almost 11 million people are arrested annually in America. Pedophilia in America has reached epidemic proportions. It's almost every day, and let me say, I, I pray for our teachers, especially our Christian teachers, and I pray for the job that they have to do. It's an impossible job. But almost every week you read about a male or a female teacher who is sexually abusing a student. Certainly that doesn't mean that it happens with all teachers. It doesn't. It's a very small minute minority, but it should never happen in America. Child abduction has gone catastrophic. 500,000 missing teenagers in America every year. 150,000, according to the FBI, are not found Every year. Why is that? Many of them are sold into slaves, third world countries, as sex slaves. Pedophiles in America. It's almost being pushed in certain cultures. The FBI says 80% of the pedophiles in America will never be caught. And when one pedophile is caught and arrested and convicted, they generally have 20 counts before they're ever caught. For the first time. Add that to the number of groups in America that are raising millions of dollars to denigrate criminal justice and law enforcement. Teach children not to respect but to hate cops. It's cost the lives and integrity of police officers, firefighters, and those that serve within that profession. Proverbs chapter number 16. Let me read that for you very quickly. Verse 6 says, By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. That's pretty simplistic, isn't it? By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. It's gone. Or it's going. You can have truth without understanding what iniquity is. That's sin. We can't label sin different than what it is. We can't label sin as a, as a mental illness. We can't label sin as an environmental thing. We can't name sin as a cultural thing. Sin is sin. All of sin comes short of the glory of God, and we can't fix that sin until people understand that's what it is, and they need mercy, and they need grace. By mercy, iniquity, truth it, it is by... Mercy and truth and iniquity is purged. And by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. By the fear of the Lord, men, what? Depart from evil. And the further we take God away from our systems, away from our churches, away from our government, so forth, the worse things are going to get. And another thing I want you to know, ladies and gentlemen, is that first responders are your friends and not your enemy. Amen. Boy, that's, what do you do when you see a police car and you're driving down the street? I'll tell you what you do. You take a foot off the gas pedal. That's okay. That's automatic. That's not a big deal. No issue there. I do the same thing, and I use one. The Bible says, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to eat through the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power, or respect it, and that which is good, and thou shalt... Or, do that which is good, and I'll shed a praise of the same. Police officers aren't looking for people that are not violating the law. They're not looking for innocent people. They're your friends. Now, let me help you out. Number one, police lives matter. All lives matter. I don't care what color they are. All lives matter. I had a friend of mine, I pastored in New Mexico. Him and I used to visit together. He happened to be a black man, uh, a dear friend, and he owned a Cadillac. I'd never driven a Cadillac before. It was an old one. And he said, Brother Brand, would you like to drive? <laughs> yeah. You know, I'd, I'd rather you get a Corvette, but a Cadillac will do. And, and so I got into the, 
driver's uh, seat of the Cadillac, buckled up, and he got in the back seat. I thought, that's kind of weird, and we're driving around for a while. We got, he said, do you know what I'm going to do? I said, that's what, Brother Greer's name is Brother Greer. He said, uh, I'm going to go around and tell my buddies that a white man drove me around town. <laughs> Their lives matter. Listen, so do yours. Amen. Teach your children respect law enforcement, not fear them. As a state trooper, my first assignment was on a turnpike in the state of Ohio. And back in those days, they had places to eat on the turnpike, I guess, until they poisoned too many people, but called them plazas. And I went into a plaza for some reason. I don't remember his call or just get a cup of coffee to go or whatever. And I remember sitting there, and there was a man over to my left, and he had two children with him. And I heard it before, and I just got tired of hearing it. And he said, like some would, and I don't remember the children's name, but said, if you don't behave, that state trooper is going to arrest you. Well, I wasn't having a good day. <laughs> and so I looked over the children and said, don't worry, kids. We don't arrest good children, just stupid parents. <laughs> I was not praised for my public relation attitude that day. But it's the absolute truth. Teach your children to respect law enforcement officers. They want to do a good job. Are they perfect? No. Are you? <laughs> They're not. Let me say lastly, honor those who honor God. Give honor unto whom honor is due. You know where you're sleeping? They're working. We used to change shifts every 28 days, and then one shift we change every three days. And it'll take a toll on you physically. It'll take a toll on your children. There was a time I didn't see my children hardly, or my wife, especially as an investigator, get called out most of the time. You know, I want you to think about this for a minute. And I had the opportunity to counsel some of the officers that were there at the scene, a couple of Texas Rangers and others. But you all remember the church in Sutherland? Man came in, thought, shot 300 rounds. You probably don't know it, but a lot of that was on tape. The, the church taped their services, or videoed, I guess would be a better term. And so a lot of that was on video. But as a law enforcement officer, and even the paramedics and so forth, they had to go inside that building. Every person in that building tried to hide. And I, and I understand that. That's what most people do. That's the automatic response. Some would try to protect their children by, by hovering over them and so forth. And the man that walked in shot outside, and, and actually there was a woman that was standing at the pulpit. I guess she was going to sing a special is what they thought. And you could tell by her facial expression that she heard something outside, didn't know what it was. And the man came in, stood in the back of the auditorium, and just shot whoever he wanted to shoot. Number of times, for whatever reason, then he came around to the front and he began to shoot people. Well, apparently the woman froze that was going to sing the special, and that happens a lot. That's, sometimes you don't have much control on your reactions. And after he'd killed a multitude of people, without her even saying or he turned around and shot her in the head. And the officers that have to go in there and investigate that have to go in and, and determine who's alive and who isn't. Then they have to determine who they are. Then they have to measure each body in placement. In other words, in those kind of murders, police officers, investigators, so forth, they're probably in that facility for over 20 hours having to look at children whose heads were half blown off. You ever been, been around something like that? You know, somebody gets shot in the head. It's not just a hole. The whole head is pretty much gone. A lot of the, I mean, it, it, I could not describe to you what that scene would be. But can I tell you this? Though, and I certainly pray for the families. That's, that's really the crux. But these officers will never, never forget. 
In fact, mo a lot of them will never stay officers. You remember the Oklahoma City bombing? I got to be friends with the uh, state trooper that arrested McVeigh, and he happened to be a Christian. I wish I had time to give you that testimony, but had it not been by the providence of God, McVeigh would have never been arrested. But within five days after the Oklahoma bombing, three policemen, two firemen committed suicide. You say, why is that? Because they couldn't deal emotionally with what they had to see. I've been to a multitude of murders. I've been to about every crime that could be committed. And the bad ones I still see. At a triple murder one time that I had to go to, a guy walked in, executed a mother, daughter, and then a visitor. I did not sleep for two days, because, and I'll tell you why. It's because I was afraid, and I knew who the murderer was. Uh, and we lived in not a large town, and I was afraid he would come in and try to kill my family. And I got past that, but I can tell you, this happened in 1983. I can remember it very vividly today. And think about what happened in Florida at that school. A tragedy above tragedies. And the officers that had to go in and, and check every room to make sure there wasn't a second shooter. So they went into the room. They did it with a certain amount of fear because there could have been someone hiding. You ever tried to search a building at night or any other time where there's thousands of places for a bad person to hide and you had to go in there? I've done it many times, and I can tell you, I've sweated. I've been afraid. But you just do it. When I searched that building, I came across students, young, innocent students who were shot with high-caliber guns. They had to see if they were, but before they could even check if they were alive, they had to check to make sure nobody was there. A long process of heartache that they will dream about Night after night after night. And let me say, please, that police officers have to make split-second decisions, which it takes courts sometimes years to determine the situation was right. Let me give you an example, if you would, and I've got a number of them. And it's in Austin as a police officer on patrol, and I get a call of family disturbance, one of the dreaded calls. So I went to the family disturbance and a woman came running out of her trailer and said, my husband's trying to kill me. I said, ma'am, does he have a gun? She said, no, he's got a knife and he wants to kill me. And I was speaking to her. The husband ran out of the, it was a trailer. He ran out of the trailer with a nice knife over his hand. He got to within three or four feet of me and I pulled my weapon. At that time, we carried revolvers and not automatics or semi-automatics. And I pulled my weapon and I told him to freeze and he didn't. And I began to pull the trigger. I couldn't have missed him. I was aiming at his head. And I was pulling the trigger back slowly. And the, <clears throat> the uh, well, my, my mind just went blank. Hammer began, <laughs> thank you, honey. I, my wife gives me the, but the hammer began to move back. And whatever reason, I guess maybe he didn't see me. But then when he did, he dropped the knife just before the gun went off. Now, if he had shot him, it would have been a good shoot. I would not have been indicted. He probably deserved it. But that quickly, I had to make a determination that should I kill him or not kill him. And in my mind, I made that right decision. I didn't kill him. Have to be a minority, though that really is somewhat immaterial, but... Could you imagine what field day the news media would have today had I shot him? The wife wanted me to kill him. And I did. The laws were quite different back then regarding family disturbance and so forth. And, and uh, I think all of us would agree it was the right decision not to kill him. Do you all agree with that? What if I told you a month later he murdered his wife? It's a decision you live with one way or the other for the rest of your life. Let me say one more thing and I quit. 
1969, I began my career in law enforcement as a state trooper. Got tired of ice and snow, went to Texas. And I ultimately was saved as a police officer in San Angelo, Texas. That's my wife's hometown. And uh, after I saved, I, for whatever reason, I got the copy of the oath that I took. And I never paid much attention to it before, you know, other than commitment and so forth before that. But I remember after I got saved and I read that oath, and I recall the situation where I had a hand on a Bible, my right hand lifted. At the end of that altar, I had to say, rightfully so, so help me God. It's the first time that I really realized two things. Number one, when I raised my hand and said, so help me God, that was an affirmation that I believed in God. I didn't think about it. I didn't disbelieve in God. But I didn't have a relationship with God. And then secondly, it was a prayer. So help me God. And what I was saying without even realizing that the profession I chose or God called me to, I could not do it without the help of God. I went to a Baptist church Invited by another police officer after I'd made enough excuses. <clears throat> and I remember thinking, I, as the preacher began to preach, I don't remember ever hearing this before. There's a long story leading up to that regarding why I was in church, but we sat in Baptist Row, that's the back row. I tell people, you can build the front row of a church out of balsa wood. It won't get hurt. But, but I remember him preaching, and I, I, we went to church the following Sunday, and remember the excitement I had because I knew. I knew, in fact, because of a murder the pre previous Sunday, I don't have time to tell you about, that I knew I had to do something. And I knew that I wanted to go to heaven when I died. And I'd come close to death so many times. When the preacher preached, my wife and I came forward and received Christ as Lord and Savior. Amen. So the preacher, 20 years later, he still had mine and Peggy's name there in Romans 10, verse 13. He's in heaven now. And I remember going to work that night. And here in Texas, I'm sure it hadn't changed much. You go 10-8 when you start shift. And I remember that I can't remember my car number then, but I went 10-8. And I can tell you this. The city I worked for got a new policeman that day. Not because I became a better policeman. Because I had a relationship with God. And I knew then, too, that if something would happen to me out on the street, if a police officer had to go to see my wife, tell my wife and four boys that I wasn't coming back home anymore, then she would at least know that I went home. That's my encouragement to each one of you all this morning. Whether you're in law enforcement or not. The one thing you and all, all of us need is the Lord Jesus Christ as personal Savior. And I can tell you if you're in law enforcement, you never know. You never know. You owe it to your community your department, and your spouse to know if something ever happened to you, and I hope it never does, that your spouse and your children are comfortable enough to know that when that happened, as tragic as it is, that heaven is your eternal home. Amen. In a moment, we're going to have an invitation. That invitation, I'm just going to encourage you. You can talk to myself or Chris or any staff here afterwards. You can come to the altar time of invitation and say, you know what? I'm like you, preacher. I, I, I'm a cop, but I knew, finally knew, that I needed Christ as Lord and Savior. My family needs it, and I need it. You see, you have to be courageous enough to admit that you need it. And let me say that I am thankful to God enough to tell you that you do. And I love you enough 
to beg you before you leave this facility today that you leave knowing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior.